Hello, everybody, and welcome to another wonderful season of the Windfall Reading Series. My name is Wendy Beck, and I work at the Public Library here in Eugene. Welcome. We've got a wonderful evening with wonderful readings. And before we do that, and before I introduce you to Henry Alley of the Lane Literary Guild, just a couple quick announcements, and then we'll be into this evening's event. The first thing is I really wanted to thank the Lane Literary Guild for all they do in the community and for making this reading possible. Without them, we would not be here. And it's just, they have so many programs and interesting readings and things that they do within the community. And as you can see, we reach people outside the community with StreamYard, so that's exciting. And um, just lots of thanks to you all for uh, participating and for making this possible and facilitating this. I also wanted to thank the Eugene Public Libraries, friends of the Eugene Public Library, they are tireless volunteers who allow us to have so many programs and events. They're fundraisers. They work tirelessly in the Novella bookstore. They are just fantastic. I'm sorry, Secondhand Prose bookstore, and they're wonderful. So thank you to the friends of the Eugene Public Library as well for making this and other programs possible. A couple quick things about how to leave comments for this reading. There are two different ways you can do so, and we welcome your comments. At the end of the readings, we will have a Q&A and comment session, so feel free to ask anything you want of these authors and of Henry. You can just leave your comments if you'd like directly below in the uh, YouTube comments page. Feel free to write anything that, that comes to mind. We always like to read them at the end and later. You can also email me if you'd like. If you're feeling a bit shy and think, oh, I really don't want to comment on such a public forum, send me an email. Let me put up my email address here for you. I'll be checking it throughout the reading and at the end of the reading. So anything comes to mind that you'd like to ask, just drop me a line and I'd be happy to uh, send that along as well so we can hear what the authors have to say at the end of the reading. All right, with that in mind, I will now gladly bring up Henry Alley of the Lane Literary Guild. Hello, Henry. Hello, Wendy. Thanks again for hosting this wonderful reading series. I just want to give you a little bit of background, all of you out there, a little bit of background on the Lane Literary Guild. The Guild was founded around 1984 and I was in on that. I was not one of the founders, but I had the privilege of seeing this group form over the years. Uh, so Ingrid Wendt and um, Bill uh, Sweet were part of that. Actually, the two together began to form this, this, this particular organization that has had such a wonderful long life. And uh, we started readings. Our, our William Stafford was probably our first reader uh, in in the series and over time got the idea that we'd have something called windfall where we would pair up a couple of writers who are distinguished in the northwest area particularly uh, around eugene and in, the, in this case around portland so we're very happy to have that the guild has had readings it's also had workshops it has critique groups and uh, we have tried to encourage all the talent that we see around us in a variety of ways among people who are writing creative nonfiction, are writing poetry, are writing fiction. And we are really privileged to have such a talented group of people around. I also would say that we probably formed the Windfall series in the early 90s. So this series has a long distinguished history and our last season for 2020-21 uh, uh, was not hampered by COVID. We, we continued to have the readings and we were really pleased to see how many readings uh, we could come up with and how many visits we've had uh, over time on YouTube to hear these wonderful distinguished people read. So uh, tonight, uh, we are going to have uh, Kate Gray, and we're also going to have Judith Barrington. And I will start with Kate Gray uh, and talk a little bit about uh, her work. And I've had the privilege of knowing Kate uh, since the early 2000s. 
we were both in uh, the Clackamas Literary Review, part of that uh, era, and uh, I remember coming, going to a reading in uh, Escadeta to hear her um, to hear her uh, being a part of that, and, and for me to do a reading. So I, I'm really happy to see how far we go back. And I just wanted to say um, there's something in particular about her re uh, poetry that has struck me. I know she's reading prose tonight, which will be really exciting. But in her poetry, and particularly the book Bone Knowing, uh, I, I've seen throughout how much the, the persona of these poems can merge with nature. I just wanted to read a little bit from the poem Lantern. The whole summer I spread through shadows, soft tendrils snaked around twigs and flower stems until October's clear blue voices called me out. Now ripe and ridged, I give up rind and sweet seedy smell. Just the part of that, and, and in, in her work, you can see how nature can come in and come in so quickly. An overview of her work provides Kate Gray's passion comes as writer, teacher, gateless writing poet, a po coach, and a volunteer. For every girl, new and selected poems was published by Widow and Orphan House in 2019. Her first full-length book of poems, Another Sunset We Survive, Cedar House Books, 2007, was a finalist for the Oregon Book Award and, and followed chapbooks, Bone Knowing, 2006, winner of the Gertrude Press Poetry Prize, and Where She Goes, 2000, winner of the Blue Light Chapbook Prize. Kate's first novel, Carry the Sky, from Forest Avenue, 2014, stares at bullying without blinking. Her poetry and essays have been nominated for Pushcart Prizes. Her novel in progress, in that novel, she narrates in Sylvia Plath's voice what led to the bell jar and her suicide attempt in 1953. Over the years, she's been awarded residencies at Hedgebrook, Norcroft, Soapstone, and Story Knife, and a fellowship from the Oregon Literary Arts. After 25 years teaching English at a community college, she retired to coach writing. Kate and her partner live in a pine and oak forest in mid-Columbia River Gorge with an impetuous city dog. So without further ado, here is Kate Gray to read. Oh. Thanks, Hank. It's so great to see you. And uh, it, we go way back. And I uh, really appreciate staying in touch and hearing you read and hearing you speak again. But thanks to Wendy to also and um, Windfall Reading Series. It's just an honor to be reading to you all tonight. And I'm kind of just sort of ecstatic and a little bit intimidated to read with Judith, my pal. Tonight I'm reading, um, as Hank mentioned, from a novel. It's told from the perspective of Sylvia Plath. Therefore, you know it's a romantic comedy. No, I'm just kidding. Um, it is, uh, Sylvia Plath was a poet who wrote an enormous amount in the mid-century of last century. Uh, so much, her letters are two volumes over a thousand pages each, poetry, prose, most famously probably the bell jar. I'm focusing on her college days at Smith College and I'm, I've taken one paragraph from the most recent over a thousand page biography, one paragraph that was given to, and this is a, uh, a trigger alert, um, one paragraph to a near rape that happened her freshman year at Smith. Um, I'm writing about this because these events still happen and the way she dealt with it is still happening today. Um, in this section, she is writing in her journal in second person. So you'll hear the use of you. So here we go. December 2nd, 1950. The blind date is older, back to college after being injured in the war, an Amherst senior. That's all you've heard. Anne set you up with her friend's ex-boyfriend. No date the last three weeks, too much history to study before Christmas. The A minus must turn to A. Every Saturday in the library makes you dull. It's terrible light, it's drafts that draw December into the stacks. Haven House girls giggle and skip down the hall before their dates return with screams and sighs. They could be sick the way they carry on. 
how you can how can you study in your room? How can you study enough? Your house mother, Mrs. Shakespeare, can't understand why you would turn down a date in late October. You must keep in circulation, my dear. Even Miss Mensel, the Smith Scholarship Tsarina, says, don't get stale. Anne is off to Columbia. She hasn't missed a weekend. You must do what Smithies do or they'll think you strange. The date says he'll meet you on Main Street in front of the general store. The low slung sun barely warms the bricks of the building. Your shoulder presses against the wall. Shops are closing. The bakery with its apple turnovers and crusty loaves all sold, closed at two. You tug up the collar on your gray wool coat and wait. You've dressed for the cold indoors, not out. A pleated wool skirt, a thin green wool sweater, a soft yellow blouse. The older Haven girls have taught you what to wear on first dates, what on second. It's an art, it's what girls do. Maybe he won't show. Your thick hose don't hold heat. The light breeze sweeps up your thighs. First dates make your skin prickle. The possibility he might take your hand if you stretch your arm on the seat between you. He might wrap his arm around your waist and brush your breast with his fingertips. Or if you're luckier still, he might read Joyce. Your date must be the one walking toward you. He's tipped forward as if pulling a weight. His gray fedora is too big for his head. Are you Sylvia? He holds out one hand to shake, one hand to cover your hands shaking. These hands have held guns. These hands can hold you. You almost forgot your name. You're lost in his Mediterranean eyes. Yes, Sylvia, handsome, rugged, just your type. Nice to meet you. So glad to meet you too. And he means it, the way his eyes widen a moment, linger, the slight lean towards you. I'm Bill. In your sternum, you feel a stab. That's what happens when something supreme passes from a boy to you. The glass of store in the store window reflects a lean boy, a lean girl, a Norman Rockwell, except he is thin, except you are taller in your black kitten heels, your hair no longer summer blonde. You should have worn flats. Cars over here. Lines carve more deeply when he speaks. Already you like walking beside him his shoulders square, his old Buick shines mustard green. He opens the door, leans down to see you are settled. The car smells of axle grease and wool. On the way to Amherst, you search for his injury. His arms look solid, not the tight sleeves of a fighting man. He is no farmer, no carpenter. He could be a salesman boosting his father's business. Blind dates are lakes newly frozen. You're not sure how to walk or where you'll fall through. What do you like to do? He starts the conversation. He has heard nothing about you. Right, ride? No. Stories? These are, there are few cars on the road tonight. His face does not light. Yes. What do you write about? He doesn't turn his head. Maybe his neck was wrenched in battle. Surely he has many injuries. Surely he has injured many people. Doesn't every writer? No. This conversation could keep you celibate. He's, he turns on the radio and Ella Fitzgerald croons into the dusk. You settle into the song, the road over the rolling hills. After the drive to Amherst, you're relieved to arrive at a frat house. Inside the living room, the two of you walk past dark wood paneling, tall bookcases, and sit at a window seat. Your thick legs and their hose stick out beneath your pleated skirt, parallel to his long legs and khakis. Couples stand near a smoky fire, Three or four couples dance the jitterbug. Without saying anything, your date walks away. He weaves through the dancers, says nothing to the boys who raise their heads as he passes. You know no one. The boys peer at you over the shoulders of their dates or when they raise their beer bottles, their cigarettes to their lips. You smile. You must. The girls are round-faced and priggish, probably from Holyoke. They glance at you to see what you've done to drive your date away. He returns with two glasses of cranberry punch and hands you one. The vodka is so strong it burns your throat. You could drink the whole bowl. Music and smoke from the fireplace, from cigarettes mix in the living room. He sets his glass on the window ledge, rises and offers his hand, the wrist thin out of the sleeve. May I have this dance? Little crow's feet radiate from his blue, blue eyes. 
the sharp edges of his jaw, the age around his eyes, you like the sorrow in his face. You'd rather dance after a few more glasses, but you set down the glass and take his hand. Your hand turns with, with his like the mechanism of a clock, slips into place. He leads, his other hand commands your hip. The two of you step right and left, sway to Bing Crosby serenading. When's your birthday? His voice rises above the music, the polite chatter, October. Sorry, I missed it, happy birthday. He makes the wish as if you were a little girl. It's hard to talk here. You hate raising your voice in a mixer other girls might hear, let's go. Through the couples and smoky room, down the stairs, he leads you to the back door. You grab your coat, follow the veteran, his shoulders broad, his gait sure, follow, O oh, captain, onward into the night. Behind the frat house, the path through the woods is an animal track, bare earth, barely wide enough for feet. It twists in the dark in the half light of the half moon. His pace is too fast. Ghoulish faces float in birch bark. You follow white puffs of his breath, the raspy sound of his breathing, the crunch of his shoes on the frosted underbrush. Ducking under limbs, making a slalom course of tree trunks, you can't keep up. Your wool skirt, his ear. Your kitten heels are wrong for the woods at night. Wait, you try to say, wait. He does not slow or stop. Under a low hanging branch, he ducks. You bend under the branch and the woods end without warning. In the clearing, he sits on the ground and looks over the valley stretching before him. You've never had a date like this, but you've never dated an older boy back from war. He's laid his overcoat on the ground for you. You tuck your skirt under, sit down, stretch your skirt as far down your legs as you can. It's cold, it's dark, you don't know where you are. The Connecticut River Valley stretches below, old hills undulating in blue-gray light. His wool coat smells warm and rank and male. The cold creeps into your legs, the sudden turn from exertion to stillness. You lean into his shoulder. After a few minutes, you ask, what was it like? For the first time, he turns toward you. War? Yes. He raises his head. Parts weren't bad. He stares over the valley. The other guys, the running. Even in the growing dark, his eyes hold blue. You sleep standing up. In the distance, a dog barks. It's hard to talk about. I'm sure. His attempt at a smile sends ripples in his cheek. I can never tell why people want to listen. In the dim moonlight, you see how he used to smile, but this smile smooths into its skin. I want to understand. You are hungry for the world, all of it, not just the pretty, but you don't know how to tell anyone. And I'm not afraid. You bury your hands between your skirt and his coat. You should be. His words are sharp, like a branch snapping. You sit as still as the cliff. Tell me, you say softly. About killing? His eyes find your eyes, lock them in a hold. You could be killed, he knows how. Every time I try to talk, it boils down to that. You cross your arms, put something between you and the way he sees you. He turns back to the valley. The strap of the helmet must have passed between his temple and his ear. You reach your hand to his. So many boys back from war. How many talk about it? He clutches your hand cold in the December night. Talking brings it back. Where his eyes are, the sockets sink deep. You try not to imagine his skull, skulls and foxholes. Maybe talking will help. His chest rises as he tries to take deep breaths. He nods. Well, it happens fast. His hands start to shake. You press his hands harder. And you move fast, instinct, you fire, run, keep your head down. He breaks the grip of your hand, then takes it back. You fire again. He is a hollow shell. He no longer sits on this hill. You run, stop, aim, fire again and again. Something falls or someone, you can't stop. His fingers thread between, your fingers thread between his long fingers. He turns your hand over, traces between the bones, like he's drawing a map on your palm. You may be his way back. You were hurt. Blood may have seeped through bandages on his head. Friends died. He clears his throat. No words emerge. He wipes his hand on his forehead, the slow motion of his forehead sliding across his palm. 
A flamethrower ripped the lining of my lungs. I was in the hospital for two years. You imagine him in a cot, sheets tucked to his chin, white skirts and shoes moving around him. A nurse dabs the sweat below his ear on his cheeks. Next to you on the cliff, he draws a knee up and wraps his arms to hold it. Did you have women there? You want to be worldly. In the hospital, he rests his cheek on his knee. Yes, a nurse, she was sweet. Others, you say to the valley below, the trees without leaves. Yes, in Hawaii, a sharp breeze blows across your legs. And in high school, they meant nothing. I want an equal I can talk to. You have never known a man who has known so many girls or a man who has killed. He stretches out his legs in front of him, thin legs from running with men with guns. His shoulders cave in. You're, you're easy to talk to. I'm not much fun these days. My father died three weeks ago. I was with him the last days. He bows his head over the hollow of his chest. I'm so sorry. You press your side against him. My father died when I was eight. He wraps an arm around your shoulders. You know them. I know. Other girls, they're not like you. They don't care. They were easy. His voice softens like a song. Easy how? You already know. He rubs his hand on your arm, squeezes your shoulder. What they had was easy to get, and they gave it. Someone like you has parts you'd never give. Of course not. The cold breeze blows stronger from the direction you ran to get here. Far away are the lights of the houses. Why would you keep things hidden? In the little moonlight, the path back has disappeared. If I gave everything away, I'd have nothing for me. In the night, leaves smell like they're decomposing. You'd have what your man has. His breath smells like the potatoes you peel to help your mother. I would give you everything. You say what he wants to hear, but you don't mean it. I'd love that. Sylvia, in one motion, he pushes your body to the ground. He's straddling you. He grabs your shirt, pulls it, his weight cutting you in two. You try to bat his hands away. This is it. No one will save you. But you twist your hips sideways. Buck, launch him off. He crashes beside you, your instinct, your animal. You scramble from the cold ground and climb on his chest, your legs on either side of him. You yell into his face. You think you can take what you want? He winces, puts his hand up to stop you. Sylvia, his face turns away, I'm sorry. You lean your face closer to his. Your breath smells sulfur on his face. He shuts his eyes. You almost spit. He can barely breathe, his neck muscles, his chest straining. You swing one leg behind you, then sit and face the valley falling away. I'm sorry, he says. He curls into a ball behind you. Your breathing can't get st steady. That means nothing, you say. A girl can't recover if she's taken. A girl can't return. You'd be ruined. The next sound from your mouth is your teeth chattering. You tuck your hands under your thighs to try to stop shaking. Your thighs are shaking. This man does not fit with college boys. This man fits nowhere. You can't believe he almost tried to, would have done a terrible thing. You can't believe you are alone out here. The cold slips down your neck. Your scent is acrid. What makes a man trap a girl? What does he think you are? Then he wraps his body around the back of you. You slow your breathing. He speaks so quietly, you think you hear singing. I'm so alone. You say nothing. He has lost so much. So many boys broken from war. He reaches one hand around your waist, holds onto you as if he might slip into the valley below. You are rock. You are anchor. You stay still to hold him on this rotten shore. In the silence, the warmth of his body wrapped around your hips warms your body. You are tucked into his chest. Through your lower back, you can feel how hard it is for him to breathe. Here, Sylvia, his big hand takes your hand and draws it behind you between his legs. At first, the warmth of his legs presses into your hand. Then he takes your hand and brings it farther up to his zipper. He moves your hand up and down. No, no, you yell, you jump away and run. Gone is the valley, gone is the animal path. Branches and needles fly at your face. Lights flicker through the trees. You run in your pathetic shoes for houses and streets and people until you find backyards and garbage cans and the alleys between frat houses. 
When you come to the street with the lights in the doorways, you tuck in your blouse, smooth your hair with your trembling hands and try to breathe, breathe. A car rolls up beside you. Girls inside are singing. Sylvia, need a ride? Maddie, a girl with eyes that sparkle like Elizabeth Taylor's, leans her head out the driver's window. We've got room, hop in. She's a sophomore on the prom decoration committee. The back door opens and you squeeze in beside two other Smith girls who smell like beer and popcorn. Thanks, you pull your coat in. You can barely swing the door closed. You may never stop shaking. The shoulder of the girl in the middle warms you. They don't care, you're quiet. When the car pulls away from the curb, the girls return to singing goodnight, Irene, as if they were in a baseball stadium. On the half hour drive between Amherst and Smith, they shout song after song. All you have to do is smile and nod every now and again. They don't see the strands of your hair pulled out of place by branches or the sweat dripping down your neck or how your world has frozen. Maddie's head, her dark hair bobs to the rhythm of each song and you try not to sit back on the cliff with a man pinning you, try not to feel his hand putting your hand on him. The girls ask nothing. Girls know the power of stories. If unleashed, they can trample your chances for marriage. Every girl must hold her stories tight. Singing and laughing, they drop you off at Haven. No one notices you slip in the house. You return to your room, a slut, a bumpkin, a tease. Sunday, December 2nd, 1950. Dear mom, Sundays are a bit brighter when a letter from you lands in my box. Thank you for keeping my spirits high. Please ex excuse how this letter may read. Last night, I shut my eyes at 2.30 and slept miserably. Don't worry, tonight I'll take two of your little pills and sleep like a baby. But I must say, I'm in a bit of a fog. Maybe a brisk walk will clear my mind so I can absorb history. All those dates and battles scramble no matter how much I study. I'm learning so much here about people and the world. It seems that there are those who never tell anyone what's really going on, put on a happy face at all times, and no one knows them truly. There are those who share their concerns with one trusted soul, and there are those who don't delve deeply enough inside themselves to know that they have concerns other than for grades and the right shoes with the right dress. You won't be surprised. These musings lead me to tell you about my date last night. First impressions are rather misleading. He looked much older than other boys, his hair receding, his forehead endless, but he had otherwise rugged looks and was quite handsome. We talked on the drive to Amherst and he's in political science and loves the Brit poets I love and so we got on quite nicely. Inside the fraternity, I mustered my courage and asked him to tell me everything that had hurt him in life and everything that elated him about which he was quite pleased. He told me about fighting in the Marianas, which sounded honestly awful. You should have seen how his face drained. But most surprising to me, his father died three weeks ago. He idolized his father and held his hand while he died. He was sorry to hear that I knew a bit about losing a father and to lighten the mood we danced. Over the music and merriment, he told me none of the other college girls he's dated to give a damn about what he's been through and he wanted to know me. He had a grand idea of going for a walk. Fresh air does everyone good. He led me out the back door. He was much more thrilling than I had imagined and perhaps I appeared too eager. When we sat in the middle of the woods in the middle of the night, he apparently thought we should have intercourse. Obviously, I stopped him quite abruptly. It was a scene, and for that I was glad we were nowhere near the frat house. But there I was, having followed him blithely in a bad spot indeed. When things settled down a bit, I asked him about women he had known, and he told me that the Marines was no place for a gentleman, and the women they met were not ladies, and he had known a nurse in the, in the hospital. This is the core of what I want to ask you. Should one count out someone who has had many relations? I mean, does their prowess make them totally unsuitable or undermine their worth as individuals? I would appreciate your thoughts. At the moment, I don't know if I will see him again. Not to worry, I took care of myself, but I've never been around anyone so single-minded. I don't know what will happen henceforth. Ever onward, your girl seems to inspire men to pour out their secrets. Maybe I ask for it. Chin up, love, Sibby. Thanks. Sorry, I went over. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it.
so vividly realized and takes us back to that particular milieu too at the same time. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so before we uh, hear from Judith, I'd just like to make a few announcements. Uh, first of all, if you want to find out more about the Lane Literary Guild, uh, you can look for us on lanewriters.org, which tells us all about uh, the Lane Writers Network and also will give you not only uh, dates for readings as far as the Guild is concerned, but for other literary events that are going on in uh, our area here. So I highly encourage you to visit that particular uh, area. The, the, the other thing is, is that we do have a River Road reading series that is happening every month and it's um, toward the end of the month on Sundays and coming up Sunday, September 26th in the River Road reading series, um, we are going to be hearing from John Morrison, Diane Stepp and Francis Ping Adler and you can find out more about them just by going into uh, looking up the uh, River Road Reading Series and uh, clicking on there. These, they will be available on Zoom on that particular day. And then also, as is true for the Lane Literary Guild, you can also uh, access them um, via the internet later on. Uh, the, the, uh, the other thing is that I wanted to particularly promote Tsunami Books. Um, that's uh, our wonderful Lane uh, County Literary Bookstore here in Eugene, and you can call them. And if you particularly want a particular book by Judith Barrington or by a Kate Gray, uh, please call and see what their availability is. And they're very happy to do special orders. And also you can visit their bookstore, uh, which has a wide variety of literary books and uh, other other available categories at the same time. So they've been tremendous support to the Lane Literary Guild by uh, having uh, space for our critique groups and having readings and promoting book launches as well. So have a look in that area as well. Um, <clears throat> so having uh, said all that, I would love to move on to introducing uh, Judith Barrington and uh, I have been particularly struck, too, by her poetry. And uh, of course, I was very much moved by Kate Gray's prose, too. And here in uh, Judith Barrington's Lost Land Poems, which was a winner of the 2008 Robin Becker Chapbook Prize, uh, I, just the, the images that this, I just wanted to mention how much they strike me. Uh, you know, you never know in her poetry, at least so far as I've read, when nature is going to come in crashing in. Um, we have uh, such lines as uh, the owl's sweet hallelujah, or we have um, the kingfisher blunders into silence through these marvelous things that come in uh, into the into the reader's view and in field of hearing too, certainly at the same time. And uh, I have enjoyed hearing her read aloud before, and we're really privileged to be able to hear her uh, read again. Um, I want to give something of an overview too of her, which like Kate's uh, biography sweeps a large area. Judith Barrington's sixth collection of, of poetry, Long Love, New and Selected Poems, came out from Salmon Poetry in 2018. And Judith's poems have appeared in many literary journals, including Prairie Schooner, America's Review, Kenyan Review, uh, Zezava, The American Voice and Poetry London. And her life-saving, a memoir, was the winner of the Lambda Book Award and a finalist for the Penn Martha Albrin Award for the Art of the Memoir. She was a faculty member at the University of Alaska and Grich's uh, MFA program and has taught for the Poetry School in the United Kingdom, Stanford University, the Arvin Foundation, and many programs across the U.S. She is co-founder of Soapstone Incorporated, an organization offering study groups on women writers in Portland, Oregon. 
So without further ado, it is a privilege to introduce Judith Barrington for her reading. Uh, thank you so much, Hank. It's a, a great pleasure to be back in the um, with the Windfall series and uh, uh, to be talking with you again after such a long time. I'm really happy, happy to have a connection back with Eugene as well. Um, we've all been so so stay, so staying in in place for such a long time that it's nice to be able to do it via technology. Um, and um, Kate, that was wonderful. I've re been actually quite coincidentally rereading Sylvia lately. Uh, I read that biography, I presume it's the, the Red Comet one, um, which renewed my interest again. And uh, uh, it reminded me that um, uh, Hank just mentioned uh, that I taught for the Avon Foundation in uh, England. I had many times did teach over there. And one of their centers that I taught at was the one called Lumbank, which was a house that had belonged to Ted Hughes' family. And while I was teaching there, I walked up the, the hill um, and uh, went to Hep Heptonstall village and went to Sylvia's grave. Um, I just saying that for no good reason, except to say I'm very connected with your, with your work and uh, I really enjoyed that, I had that that segment and I'm looking forward to the book. So I'm uh, reading poetry, although I'm actually writing prose at the moment um, as well. Um, and, but as a poet, um, I have to say, we, we poets are always thinking about um, good, good excuses for uh, why it's hard to find a good subject for a poem. And this poem I'm gonna start with, my excuses uh, that, uh, that I had no grandparents or hardly had any grandparents. What's a poet to do? So many of them write about their grandmothers and sometimes grandfathers too. But mine were all dead. The grandmother nameless in her black Victorian hat, tartan blanket over her knees in a wheelchair on a seafront somewhere. Was she the one called Ada? An eccentric grandfather, the only one mentioned, Daniel with the bowler hat and Esperanto translations of Shakespeare, eccentricities leading to tall stories as he swings his cane and takes a stroll before dinner. What's a poet to do? No fresh baked bread verses, no special bond renewed through summer visits, idyllic as only a skipped generation portrays them, wild incomprehensible love for the living proof that parents once had their own parents, were once even children themselves. And now even those parents are dead. So how to write of the elders, ancestors moldering underground, just so many absences, refusing to pose in my poems, refusing to pat me on the head, my, how you've grown, and stay alive in their sepia cliches. But there they are, a couple of them forever fixed by triangular corners onto thick black pages of a leather bound album. What's a grandchild to do? No one wrote down the names or the dates. No one recalls coerced visits, querulous complaints, the brass ear trumpet in the nursing home. Not even the surreptitious passing of a coin from age spotted hand to sticky palm. Well, um, Hank mentioned that a uh, chapbook I ha have, um, well, I have actually two chapbooks, but um, one of them is very ocean related. Um, I have to say that this pandemic has caused many people all kinds of tragedy, really, um, and that's, mostly not me, although there has been one or two in tragic moments um, and friends of friends. Um, but one of the things that's been hard for me has been that it's been the longest time that I have never have gone without, without seeing the ocean. I grew up beside the ocean and uh, for reasons of uh, having to do with 
disability that I have, it's been very hard to get to the beach um, during this time. So I would like to re call up the ocean uh, because I'm missing it. This is a poem called The Book of the Ocean. <clears throat> They've all written their books. The wind with its scattering of seeds, its steady erosion of terraced hills, histories carved in the gray faces of cliffs whose grief it transcribes into song. Rain with its poetry, quick rivulets or pocks that rattle on the roofs of our minds. And sunshine with its golden tails, honey in the mouths of heroes, warriors who blaze and die young. The book of the ocean is the greatest and most neglected. It floats in shadows under rock shelves. It laps at the edges of dreams, a reminder of the deep dark into which we dive nightly. A reminder of the moon that holds us and hurls us on the brink of wrinkled lands where once we staggered ashore trying to become human. It is written on wavy scrolls at the tide line. It is written as a crab on a dry desert rock. It is written in green and indigo, sometimes a wash. It is written to be studied from space or through the mask on a diver's face. Its comedy splashes our feet. Its tragedy writhes in the tides of the night. Like it or not, we are turning the watermarked pages, their words hissing in our ears with blood and with salt, while the moon grows fat, then wanes to the sweetest sickle. So um, I'm going to move to actually read you a little piece of prose at this point um, from a whole uh, work that is never getting finished, of course, and something uh, I was working on for a long time, which was about the many oceans that I've known in my life. Um, but uh, I wanted to stay, uh, well, I wanted to, uh, to, to say that I grew up in Brighton by the sea um, and that uh, that has stayed with me. I think that that place has stayed with me um, very potently. And uh, like many of us, I think there's always that yearning to go back to home. But this poem questions that about, well, what is the, what is, what is the use of that? particularly since I was born there, but during war, wartime, um, born during a, an air raid, in fact, so that the windows were flying out while I was coming into the world. Um, anyway, uh, this is a little piece of, from, it's from a work called Brine. <clears throat> and it's also, a, it also came to me to read this. I, I wanted to just say that last week there was a, a notice in the paper um, about a um, uh, some uh, organization called Colossal Labs. I don't know if you caught that, but they're developing or trying to develop a cold resistant elephant um, with the biological traits of the woolly mammoth. Um, I th the woolly ma mammoth went extinct about 10,000 years ago, um, but um, it appears in this little piece of prose, which is really about the English Channel that runs between England and France. From Brine. During the glacial stage that began some 1.8 million years ago, the sea level around Britain was almost 400 feet lower than at present, and the English Channel was dry land. During warmer interglacial periods, the fauna resembled that of modern day Africa, with hippos, elephants, hyenas and lions roaming southern England. During the cold episodes, they were replaced by woolly mammoths, woolly rhinoceros, and reindeer. As the climate began to fluctuate, glaciers from the north and east of Britain, sometimes three miles thick, began to melt, carrying down gravel and sand and creating new courses for rivers such as the Thames, which would later, during the great frost of 1608, freeze over again 
and allow Virginia Woolf's hero, Orlando, to skate under London Bridge with her Russian princess. This water might have captured my imagination if I had known any of its history, but I thought of it only as the sea. To those of us who lived on its northern shore, it was not a sea on a map with a name, not one of many other named seas, but simply the sea. Not only did we take it for granted, we hung it in our minds as the backdrop to which, to everything, rides to school on the number 12 bus, which took the seafront route, gallops on the top of the downs that looked out beyond the power station across the water towards France, even when we walked the docks along the lawns behind the sedate bathing huts at home. It was there, a quiet but reliably joyful presence. And then I'm going to move into a poem about as uh, contrasting as it can be from, from the very freedom of writing uh, lines that are not lines, but prose, which goes all the way across the page, to a, po a poem um, also dedicated to my hometown, Brighton, um, which is a Sestina poem. Um, the reason I've chosen, one of the reasons I've chosen to read this is because I like to remember Brighton. Um, and I mentioned uh, that I was born there during the war, um, but, but also because, it, let's face it, it's really hard to get to the end of a Sestina, and I got to the end of this one. So this one is called Blame the Moon, dedicated to Brighton, England, 1944. I was born under the left-handed full buck moon of July, sinister light flooding the rubble, of blasted stones. Red cross workers dragged away the wounded as the moon slipped widow shins behind flak torn clouds. I was caught between the waxing and waning, caught in her cycle to swell like the tides, full bellied, bleeding on command, lagging behind as she trekked along the Camino of Light. I blamed her as I woke to find the world wounded, the beach itself a ruin of tarry stones. What can you do, old loony, when the stones of a city are flattened in alleys or caught in gutters where cats lie starving or wounded? It's out in the forest when the streams are full and the salmon thrusting upstream that your light urges us to seek the birthplace we left behind. And what is there for me in that home behind a wall of years, crafted from slate dark stones? I have no map, no memory, not even light when the moon's face is hiding. So why be caught by the urge to visit that earliest place, full of bombs and death and the unquiet wounded? Still, I write of those times even of the wounded, willing my words to leave them behind, trusting that I know them, though memory is full of mistakes. All I'm sure of are the round gray stones on the beach where an unexploded bomb once caught a trespassing child and swallowed her with light. The light of a bomb is nothing like moonlight and a child torn to pieces can't be called wounded. The boy in the barbed wire was luckier, caught by coils that rolled like tumbleweed behind the beach in case invaders should cross the stones at low tide when the moon wasn't wickedly full. But tonight's stone-faced moon sheds no light as I seek the full story, a child's story hidden behind dark clouds, a wounded past that won't be caught. <clears throat> I'm reading from uh, this book, Long Love, um, which is new and selected poems. So there are poems from all of my previous five books in here. And it's always an interesting ex uh, exercise when you try to pull out the poems from all those first books that you want to keep, um, uh, maybe bring back to life a little bit. Um, 
so one of the things that happens when you're doing that is you do start to see the themes that repeat themselves in your work. And uh, people who write about my poetry, poetry books have once in a while have tried to tell me, oh, you write about this, you write about that. But it's very clear when I was pulling these out that one of my major themes is the ocean. And I've touched on that now with a couple of poems. But the other theme that's always coming up is horses. Um, in fact, one of my books was called Horses and the Human Soul. Um, so there are poems that I, I could say are about horses. And then there are many more poems where I should like really say that a horse snuck in. You know, there are sneaky horses that I didn't even realize were in some of these poems. This is a poem that I really think is about the, what it's like to, to write a poem. The, what happens when it's when there's a poem that you can't quite grab or you don't have time to sit down, but it bothers you and you want to write it. Um, and then, of course, there's the sneaky horses. The poem. It hides in my heart, waiting as if in the small circle at the middle of the labyrinth. I walk towards it, but the path turns away by a purple foxglove and I must follow the windings that will in the end lead me to the center. It smells of cedars and honeyed skin, cappuccino with grated chocolate, the brine of its own body's betrayal. Like a chestnut horse, it hides in shadow, one white sock and the moist gleam of an eye announcing its steady presence. It has lodged in my heart like a stone in the shoe. Each time the great muscle contracts, I feel it rubbing the same tender spot. There is no avoiding it, no limping or hopping, no shaking it to a more comfortable place, no stillness that can ease the bruise except the stillness of a motionless heart. It is the door behind which somebody stands waiting to kiss and be kissed. And this one really is about horses. It's actually about the horse I had when I was a teenager who was a beautiful, wonderful horse named Black Magic. And he was also a terrible escape artist. <clears throat> Harvest. When you're young and out at night, searching for your lost pony, the black sky leans on your shoulders like a rucksack full of sins. Under invisible stars, you carry the burdens, gates left unlatched, temper tantrums that sent the pony bucking away in his field. And all those times you laughed at the farmer, a door man who watched the sky as harvest approached, watched the corn ripen, while you and your pony cut the corners of those brittle fields, flattening his bread and butter. When you're young and out at night, calling for your black pony through field after field of grain, an owl flings itself down from an oak, and you make vows. If only you could find the pony, but remember too the vows you make and remake on a dark night searching. Um, uh, this is one more poem that has to do with horses and it's um, dedicated to the late Maxine Cumin, who was a very dear woman, I can't say a dear friend, she wasn't a close close friend but she she was a friend to me and she was a, um, a model to me as well. And I love her poems. And I took one of her lines um, as an epigraph to this poem. The line of hers is, I believe in the gift of the horse, which is magic. Um, <clears throat> and it's called Living Without Horses. Living Without Horses is like breathing into the lungs, but never further, never deep into the great cavity below where horses of emerald and blue fill the void with their squeals, their thudding feet, 
their waltzes into deep space. To live without horses is to slow down on the sunset highway at a glimpse of chestnut rump or a pair of pricked ears above a bay face with a kind eye that gazes towards the forests draped like shawls over the coast range where blue jays and woodpeckers ring out false alarms. And to breathe in the sweat and dust of the police horse found unexpectedly tethered to your parking meter after lunch. Then at night, to rewind the videotape over and over as the Budweiser commercial sends you flying with the royal herd, manes and tails like curtains of water, nostrils more finely flared than the shelled human ear, their elephantine feet pounding the doors of a shuddering underworld in the slowest waltz you've ever heard, until suddenly you're hearing it in your abdomen and it spills over into arteries and bones, pulsing through all your crevices like blood from the heart's pump. To live without horses is to carry them with you always. The one who lifted you over the tiger trap, the one who kicked you when you deserved it, and the dappled gray one who lay down under you and died as you ran away, unable to stay with him on that path beside the golf course, breathing in what you would search and search for in the years to come. So um, I think I have two more poems. I'm just trying to keep track here. Um, so um, I, I have I have uh, mobility problems. I, I mentioned, and uh, that is partly because I have a neuromuscular disease. It's a genetic disease, um, and it's one of the diseases of the genetic kind. That means that one of my parents passed it on to me, but my parents died before I was old enough to either be diagnosed with it or to um, wonder or to ask them questions to find out who it what might have been. And so that wondering enters into this uh, poem. Um, the disease is a neuromuscular disease that, uh, that affects the, the, the messages that go from my brain to my feet primarily and then also to my hands. Neuromuscular. The brain talks to the feet and the feet talk back. Unless, of course, they're not the talkative kind or just a little slow to get the message. Messages travel along nerves, like telephone wires sagging between poles, runways for squirrels, or roosting spots for gloating crows. Try to picture a nerve running down inside a leg. Is it a fishing line, a thread of cobweb, or perhaps a strand of white hair? And what of the gene that messed it up, diagrammed in medical books as a double helix, twisted, intertwined ribbons suggesting the number eight? Does the damaged one look a little sheepish next to its healthy mates? And here's another question. Which parent gave it to me? Unknowingly passed on the gift of an inheritance, not the sort to invest but one that numbs my toes, sends me toppling face first onto the pavement, forces me to learn words like myelin and mitochondrial protein. My mother's feet were as ugly as mine, which makes her the chief suspect. Though like me, she carried on walking dogs and dreaming of her heyday on the tennis court. At night, I tossed the ball drop my racket behind my shoulder and swing high overhead. My serves defy the frayed threads of nerves and muscles withered from neglect. At night, I serve an ace and sprint to the net. We can dream. I've watched a lot of tennis lately in the armchair. <laughs> And one more, I'll finish with this one. Uh, also because when I think about um, 
the word disabled and it's for disability, which is coming up more and more in my life. Um, I, I think about it in different ways. And one thing that I was thinking about recently was uh, Adrian Rich, who, um, who I sort of argued with in my head uh, for years when she came out with um, the um, lesbian continuum, the idea that we were all in a continuum between heterosexuality and lesbianism. Um, and But I have to say that uh, because I, because of that concept, I've started thinking about the disability continuum. It's like we're not at any one spot on that. We're not either all, you know, perfect or or broken. Um, so that hence the the title of this poem, which is, uh, "We are all broken." We are all broken. An ankle here a crooked finger there, bones in a lower back, or the still sweet curve of a graceful neck. Some of us broke with age, joints worn out, ears losing the high notes, eyes fogged like the car windows when as teenagers we made out beside the lake. Others have lived with the damage for years, building into each day the oxygen tank, the pain pills, the enormous challenge of a shower and a cup of tea. We may be broken in spirit, like horses made docile under the bit, and the dog alone at the window waiting for something to happen. Or broken in the heart, some in that real fist of flesh with its unwanted syncopation or creaky valve, others in the metaphorical organ, split by a jagged strike into two misshapen halves when the best beloved was lowered underground and we dropped our handful of earth onto the coffin lid with a muffled thud. When I was a girl, I had an army of broken lead soldiers and a gray fort whose ramparts they defended. Together, we kept the invaders at bay and I will continue to keep them at bay as long as I can. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judith, with such moving poetry and such a vivid uh, experience that you've been able to create for us. So thanks so much. So we would like to um, move into any questions uh, that our audience might have. And if not, I, I'll, I can get the, the ball rolling here. Um, Anything yet coming up, Wendy? Nothing via email. So, mm -hmm. um, and some some kind comments in YouTube, but uh, I don't see any direct questions. Okay. Well, let me launch. Let me just. Uh, I'll ask uh, Kate. Um, you must have been challenged uh, when writing this this piece, the piece that you read to make the man vivid and make his reality uh, somehow uh, tenable to the reader, um, as well as, of course, Sylvia's. Uh, do you want to talk to us a little bit about that? Um, sure. Um, this was, you know, this was a real person. Um, this was a real event. So that helps. And um, one, at one point, one manifestation of this particular uh, scene Someone said, "Oh, you're going to make the uh, the one veteran in the in the book the bad guy, are you?" And I went, "No, all just about everybody was a veteran at that time." And um, uh, and no, he's he's not. He's actually, I mean, yes, he did a terrible thing. And Sylvia is also relating to him in terms of his pain, and. Um, so there's that's so, so that's part of what uh, I had to make him have some humanity, and he, I, I hope he does, um, even though it's a villainous act. So it's it's a it's a tough balance to try to try to portray. But um, yeah, and one spoiler alert: um, she goes on two more dates with him. <laughs> Which yeah, now we kind of go well, really, but um, think about yeah, you know, it's, it's not all that surprising either. 
So um, I don't know if I answered your question, Henry. I think. I think he's asking not to be muted. He's muted, Wendy. I know. Yeah. Oh. So somehow, uh, Henry, try to unmute yourself. For some reason, it's showing there you. Are. There yeah. you go. You have okay. to unmute yourself. Okay. I'm, I appreciate you. Yeah, I think definitely you did. I think that uh, the physical reality for her and the physical reality for him is nicely conveyed. Oh, sure. thank you. Yeah, very Thanks nicely so done. Uh, Judith, you very evocatively talked about how the ocean has consistently been a source of inspiration for you, could you talk a little more about that? I mean, I know you, you mentioned that you you grew up in that that environment, but would you like to talk a little more about that and its influence on your poetry? Um, I seem to have, well, when I started to think about it, uh, writing this long prose piece, which I never finished yet, but um, I seemed it seemed to me that my life, in a way, I could divide my life up into oceans. You know, I grew up next to the English Channel, which was probably the most formative one in a way, because my school from the library it was a Gothic building on top of a hill, and it looked out over the English Channel. Um, we always pretended we could see France, but of course we couldn't. Um, and my life went from there, and then my next piece of my life, I had got a job in Spain, and I lived on the Mediterranean, where, which I completely fell in love with. I love that ocean dearly and go back, have been going back whenever I could and actually taught a class in Southern Spain for a while just so I could get to the Mediterranean. Um, and then, um, uh, and then of course I came to Oregon and the Pacific was just an incredible shocking thing to me. I mean, it was so huge and so ferocious and of course, the Mediterranean and the English Channel can be like, they can be stormy, but but it, it felt like a completely different animal. Um, and then when I started to write this piece about the oceans, I realized that I have been avoiding the Atlantic. Well, actually, of course, I have written a lot about my parents' deaths and they drowned in the Atlantic, but somehow I had forgotten that. You know how that, how that is for a writer? Uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to not, is to just not put things aside. Um, and I found that um, actually I was very influenced right when I tried to write about the Atlantic and not necessarily to write about it as, as having swallowed up my parents. Um, the, the poems of Lucille Clifton were very helpful and how she wrote so much about um, the slaves coming across and the terrible um, realization of the mothers who threw the babies overboard and um, that, that there was just a slave history in, in that ocean which kept creeping into what I wrote. Well, of course, that's not my history, but, but um, nevertheless, it was, it was another aspect and a different angle. So I'm, I'm talking about, so that, that's, oceans have followed me around or I have followed them around. Thank you. Um, and Kate, uh, you, when you're writing this prose piece, you really kind of had to steep yourself in the, in the mm -hmm. post-war period. And um, I think you're, you're too young to remember that period. Uh, I'm old enough to remember some of it. So, but how did you manage to steep yourself in that particular period? Well, um, I'm the youngest of six, and um, my I'm I have a lot of older uh, siblings and cousins, and um, my mom's family was very uh, formidable and uh, influential. So um, I I it's not hard because that generation was so much more dominant than my generation. You know, it's like they were much louder in the room than we ever were. Um, and so I feel like, I mean, some of the sayings that, that I grew up with were actually from the 40s, 30s and 40s, because that's what my parents were saying. And um, so, and then there's, you know, good old Google. You can just find yeah. out just any. And now that I'm really following the historical uh, legend, uh, I have to think, okay, what sandals would she be wearing? 1951, I mean, I, I, and you can find it. 
it's just extraordinary. Um, so I try to be as historically accurate and think, okay, what were the, what was Ella Fitzgerald singing right then? Or, you know, so it's, it's fun. And, and I end up dreaming uh, at Smith, that I'm at Smith College in 1950, which is a little bit scary. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <Thank you. laughs> Judith, in, in your book, Lost Lands and Poems, uh, Virginia Woolf plays an interesting part. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Uh, she's there for breakfast, right? Uh, oh, the, yes. Oh, um, a quote from Moments of Being, and uh, I just wondered if maybe I'm off on something that's not terribly important. Uh, yeah, I can move to another. Uh, example, but. I think you're thinking there was a, um, a. I was very influenced. There was a poem. You know, it's a terrible thing, but I cannot. Somebody might be able to remember who the poem was about. Was by, but it was about. Uh, oh, it's it was. Uh, Galway Canal about having breakfast with John Keats, and uh -huh. and I and I love that poem, and I love Galway Canal also. I think it's great, um, and it, it somehow inspired me to think about writing a poem about having breakfast with Virginia Woolf, which is a, an amazing idea. Um, I can't think what what I was thinking, but <laughs> but um, I, and I can't remember the poem all that well. But um, that's that was a she was very much in my mind at, at the time I was writing those poems that, that are in that chapbook. And I also have, a, I think it was in that same chapbook, um, a poem about Vita Sackville West, her lover. Um, and, and that was because it was one of the books I read about the Bloomsbury's. There was a wonderful photograph of Vita uh, walking, striding through her garden, wearing a pair of Bridges that had little buttons all the way down the side, followed by two Irish wolfhounds, and, and I just had to write a poem about her because of that that photograph. Well, I, I wonder it might lead to a little bit larger theme of uh, memory as kind of consolation that seems to be in your writing. Uh, do you do you feel that? I mean, that the memory is invoked and it becomes a kind of uh, source of uh, maybe a refuge of some kind, or um, does that? You or Kate? Are you Kate? You you could answer that. Okay. No, oh, uh, ah, um, thanks, Judith. Uh, oh, sorry, I can answer. Yeah, I can I can I can elucidate on it if it's something that's. Uh, or just move on if that's something that just brings up a stone wall. But it just seemed to me that memory in both your works plays a really important part, mm -hmm. uh, especially like the specter of the war in your work. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then just uh, some of the the um, personal memory that comes up in Judas' work uh, yeah. seems a source of, and, and, and I mean, even yeah. just, Oh, I'm feeling lonely, so I think I'll invite Virginia Woolf for breakfast. I mean, it's just, I think it's just, it's That's great. I, I respond to, certainly. So I'll start with Kate, and then if Judith has anything. Well, I, I'm not sure if um, in class life there's necessarily consolation. Um, the, her, the specter of her father's death was ever present and um, was not necessarily something that was um, comforting to her. Um, definitely the war affected everyone. And in, in particular, one of the, things, the ways it affects, affected her that I don't think people realize quite so much is that um, she's the daughter of immigrants, right? So uh, her, for instance, her, they, she lived with her Austrian grandparents and during the war, she was in the grocery store with her grandmother and was chased out because the, the people near Boston uh, where mm -hmm. there was an internment camp for, for German Americans, uh, chased them because they thought they were German. So um, that's you know, and her her dad was investigated by the FBI, uh, even though he emigrated to the U.S. in 1905. Um, so, but he didn't buy a, a war bond for the First World War. So I'm not sure if it's consolation necessarily, but it's definitely an investigation. Definitely, she's trying to figure out herself by investigating her past. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, anything else on that score, Judith? Or well, I, th I mean, I think because I've written memoir and I've taught memoir quite yeah. a lot, 
I've, I've had to think a great deal about memory and the complete unreliability of memory uh, um, and um, also just um, how many how many people really want to write their reminiscences and re how they want to go back in time now uh, there was a time when I thought that was that was that there was, I had a friend who was in cultural studies and she was often talk about how the British culture is a backward looking culture and American culture is a forward looking country and therefore Americans are sort of looking at uh, forward and what, what they can do. I think this is a gross, a gross, gross um, generalization. But so for a while I thought, well, you know, why is it? I am very, very caught in, up in thinking about the past. Um, and uh, I, I don't actually know if it's a consolation. I don't know if, it, if it's consoling to remember I like to be able to, but I think partly that's because I don't trust my memory. I, I find people, there are people who remember a lot of things much more than I can. Um, so anything you see that I write down that pretends to be true, don't trust me. <laughs> that's all I know. <laughs> we, we have time probably for just one, one more question per person. Um, I don't see any questions, do you, Wendy, that have come up on uh, YouTube? I don't see anything there. There's some wonderful uh, people have really responded so nicely to your work, but uh, nothing's taken the form of a question. Okay, I'll just ask um, Kate, uh, I guess great, hey. a, a totally un great. unfair <laughs> question. Oh, okay. <laughs> But what what drew you to writing about someone who's whose end is suicide? I mean, it would be like it would be in some ways like writing a you know a Shakespeare five act tragedy, um, you know, with a Roman theme or something. But uh, can you tell us a little bit about your gravitation towards that subject? Uh, well, I have I, um, there. Ha there have been more people in my life who have suicided than have died of AIDS or uh, just about anything else. And so I've been trying to figure it out for quite a while. Um, Plath, one of the reasons that Plath is in my life is because she was at Smith College um, with a, my aunt in the same dorm. And my aunt died the year after Plath suicided um, of natural causes. So she died, Plath died at 30, my aunt died at 31 and left five children. And um, they were very similar in many ways and they were very different in other ways. And so my, at first uh, I started this to learn about both of them um, because they are, I never met my aunt, um, but I adore my cousins. Um, so, uh, it, it's, it's been, and, and Plath came to my grandmother's house, uh, and wrote one of the longest lever, letters she ever wrote, uh, um, to her mom about that visit. So it's, it's intrigued me since, um, I was about 16 when I read the letter, letters home. So, um, it's been a long journey. <laughs> I, I can, I can completely understand my father. <laughs> My father worked for Tennessee Williams' father. Oh and I my gosh! Writing. You know, it's just like I keep going back. He was full of all these stories. He, wow. Yeah, I, I completely get it. And wow. you, um, I guess it, it. I know this is such a large question, but the 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 image of horses, as you say, is in so much of your your writing. Can you talk a little bit about it? I have kind of a personal Thank agenda you. on that because my my husband's collection, The Mystery of Horses, is sort of around mm -hmm. some of this. And I'm not a horse person, so I'm, I'm interested in how this, in, in, in its connection to poetry for you. Um, well, this is a big question, but I'd say probably two things stick with me. One is um, uh, in the poem, Horses and the Human Soul, the title poem of that book, I wrote about an incident in which um, uh, there, were, uh, there was a tragedy going on in Oregon where people were breaking the legs of horse race, of thoroughbred horses to collect insurance. Um, and uh, oh. sorry, I didn't say that, I should say <laughs> that. No, it's a horrible <laughs> image. Um, 
But in the course of writing about that particular poem, one of the sections, I, I was a, had many sections. One was, uh, I had at the time had a therapist who was a Jungian, and she used to talk to me some about Jungian images. And she told me that if you dream about ho a horse, that's your spirit, you're dreaming about your spirit. Yeah. And that came into the poem. And um, I've often thought about that since because uh, I don't know why. I mean, I don't necessarily think they're particularly spiritual poems, but I like that idea that that's a part of me that's coming through when I write about a horse. Yes. Um, and uh, I don't know. The other thing was I wrote I wrote a piece about going back to see that horse that I, I mentioned, Magic, the horse I had when I was a teenager. Ruth and I went to England when I first knew her, and we and I knew where the horse was. He had been sold to a family that had five kids, and he was left in an orchard there, very old, and we went to visit him. And he was, I think, 33 years old. And Ruth likes to tell the story. She claims that he remembered me. Well, I think he remembered the bucket of oats that I was making noise with. But nevertheless, that's a great story. And I, I published it in the, when the, the Sunday Oregonian used to have a, a magazine section. And I got more letters about that piece from people than anything I've ever wrote. Like I got a lot of, a lot of old guys from Eastern Oregon who wrote me about their horses. And it was like amazing. And I really understood what a point of connection there is between humans who appreciate horses at all. Wonderful. Well, thank you both for your readings. Thank and you. Responses. Thank you. And thank you, Kate. I invite you to see all the the positive remarks that have been made on YouTube, and uh, we really appreciate your your sharing with us tonight. I, I just want to give a preview. Uh, next next month, we will be hearing from Michael McGriff, wonderful poet from this area, and also Annie Shepard, who is vice president of the Lane Literary Guild and is a writer of prose. And uh, in, uh, in November, we will be uh, hearing from a couple of people who have been published in the Pacific Northwest Poetry Series, Nance Van Winkle and also John Witte. Um, and we've invited Christopher Howell, who's director of Lynx House Press, who will be putting out the latest installment um, in that series, which will be Nance Van Winkle's. So, that should be in a, a kind of a book launch also. So thanks all for uh, attending tonight. And so, so nice to hear all of you. Yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you, Wendy. Thank you. This has been wonderful. What a great launch for the next season. <laughs> thanks, everybody. Thank Good you. Night. You're all. Thank you. Thank you. It was great. Bye. Good night.